Right. Joining me now, James Ashby, Chief of Staff for One Nation, and Christy McSweeney from PR Council. Welcome to you both. Christy, let me start with you. Uh, were you aware the public service in Victoria, 54,000 of them, were going to be handed a $5,600 cheque, each of them, paid for by you and I? Steve, I absolutely was not aware of that. So thank you for bringing it to light. And as someone who lives in Melbourne uh, and has lived in Sydney as well for well over a decade, I will take your points and I'll raise you another one. Let's just compare Docklands to Barangaroo. Let's have a look at what Sydney's been able to do with what was traditionally and previously a train, a rail yard compared to what Melbourne's been able to do to populate Docklands. And of course, uh, your points about the public service as well. The hard left Victorian government here is absolutely beholden uh, to public sector unions in a way uh, that uh, the New South Wales government, successive governments, are not, and I commend Chris Minns, it's not very hard to vote for him at the moment, is it, uh, for getting the public servants back to work. And another point I want to raise, he might be seeing what's coming down the line uh, with governments being directed not to utilise consultancies of the big four um, so much. He wants to build a public service capability. He wants the public servants to do what they're supposed to to curb the spending that state governments have, outsourcing what their public servants should do to big four consultancies who are ripping off the taxpayer to the nth degree. James, welcome to the, uh, the Man Cave on this Sunday night. Um, when you think this through, I mean, the, the previous Labor opposition in Canberra used to scream about what Scott Morrison and the former Morrison government were doing in terms of pork barrelling. They, they, you know, they talked about car parks uh, that were funded to be built in railway stations that never got built, or if they were built, they were in, in electrics that they wanted to win. But the Victorian Labor government is doing this on a bigger scale than I think we've ever seen in Australia. That, that ridiculous suburban rail loop is a, a, across a bunch of south, south eastern suburban Melbourne suburbs that they want to either retain as Labor voters uh, or get uh, people to vote for them in those seats. And they're, they're giving out cash to the public service. I mean, if you're in the public service and the government's sending you, you know, $5,600 in $100 notes in an envelope in your bank account, you're hardly going to vote them out, are you? No, exactly right. I find that extraordinary. Five thousand dollar, you know, bonus at this time of the year when everybody else is doing it tough. I, I know a whole lot of people sleeping along the Rocky River Bank tonight that would love a five thousand dollar injection uh, here in Queensland. That's for sure. But you know, this is a state that, in effect, if they were a business, they would be trading insolvent. That's how in debt they are, and there is no recovery rate at the moment. I think a lot of people out there in business would love just this never-ending blank checkbook that the Victorian government seem to have. But these rail projects right across the country, not just in Victoria, but take, for example, the inland rail are causing significant headaches for governments. Federal government can't get their act together on this one either. Uh, mind you, when you compare the two projects, inland rail is a 1,600 kilometre rail track that's been built at a cost of $30 billion. It's still years off. They're only about a fifth of the way through. But again, it's, it's creating problems. This is the rail link from uh, Melbourne to Brisbane. And uh, rail is definitely a great way to get people around. It's a great way to get uh, more cargo around the country as well. But uh, these cost blowouts just seem to be astounding. And Victoria, you take the cake. You win the prize for the biggest blowouts. It's just extraordinary. No wonder. I was at the Emu Park Markets today, Steve. I ran into more Victorians here today than I've ever run into before. They're migrating north. You can keep your lefties down there with you. We'll take all the Conservatives here in Queensland. That's all I'll say. No doubt about that, James. Christy, you know that. I mean, look, I'm agnostic here. I love both Sydney and Melbourne, and I come from Adelaide, so I love all three. I've never lived in Brisbane. But when you come to Sydney, and I'm, I'm in Sydney, obviously, in Paul's Man Cave tonight, when you come to Sydney and compare it directly day on day with Melbourne, Melbourne at the moment is covered in graffiti, 
Uh, it's got a, a, a war going on with its Melbourne City Council who don't know what they're going to do, and, and the policies of the people trying to get elected are just insane. And Nicholas Reese has come up with some mad power idea that I can't understand. Uh, but you go to the two main train stations, uh, Christie in Melbourne, are, are Flinders Street and Southern Cross Station. Compare those to, I don't know if you've been recently to Central Station in Sydney, where you, you get the airport train that also Melbourne doesn't have and never mm -hmm. will have, uh, or you go to Wynyard Station, where it opens up into Barangaroo that you mentioned. The two places are like light and shade. The, 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 there's no comparison anymore. It's incredible, isn't it? I'm like you. I'm from Western Australia, as you know. I lived in Sydney for over a decade. I've lived in Melbourne for over a decade here too. I love going to Sydney. Uh, Sydney viewers won't realise that, you know, if you come to Melbourne, you can't tap your MasterCard or your Visa card no. uh, at a train station and get on a train like you can in every other global city in the world. Uh, you have to have what's called a Mikey, uh, which was so badly managed by the previous Labor government uh, that they had to pay compensation uh, to the Mikey system administrators uh, because it doesn't work properly. Uh, so you can't do any of those amazing things that the New South Wales government, and I will give credit to the previous New South Wales Labor government, but of course it was almost wholly implemented by Victor Dominello, the Department of Customer Service with New South Wales Transport. This incredible global transport system, uh, digitally integrated, that you have running in New South Wales. Melbourne is like a communist, historic utopia lovers paradise <laughs> uh, the trains are not flashed they don't really run on time it's gritty it's bleak uh, the infrastructure is certainly not beautiful and dazzling like we see in Sydney if you like that sort of thing perhaps that's a new tourist in Victoria ad and as I said I live here I love it but gosh, you make you can a tell stock the in real estate agent. Of, inve of investment. <laughs> we could, uh, we could yes. stick. We could stick on the num <laughs> We could stick on the number plates. Victoria, the the graffiti state. Uh, James, Katie Gallagher is out yeah. today saying she's not going to rein in states like Victoria over all this infrastructure spending. Although clearly it's contributing to inflation, she said, "Quote: The treasurer and I don't really tell other administrations or other governments how to do their job." Hello, James. Surely the federal government's going to say to Victoria. Uh, uh, guys, uh, you're broke. What the hell do you think you're doing? Well, this is the problem. Um, you've got these EBAs being drawn up by uh, state governments here that are paying lollipop people, uh, traffic controllers, $180,000 a year. Uh, that is adding to the inflation, let alone uh, some of the government policies that uh, Labor have rolled out in previous governments as well. NDIS comes to mind straight away. That is definitely feeding inflation. Uh, in fact, we've got issues here in Queensland where uh, the NDIS has taken people away from jobs. Uh, I was only at the Endeavour Foundation the other day where you know, a lot of those people that would have previously worked in the Endeavour Foundation uh, now have got these UBU uh, NDIS packages. So they're off to the movies. They're off fishing. They've got their carers there and uh, they're adding to this inflationary bubble because um, it's just it's not worth uh, working these days if you can get one of those packages and you, you're encouraged to go and spend copious amounts of money. We've got some people on packages well over a million dollars. Some people are using sex workers. Others are just going to the movies and doing trips wherever they tend to like to go. So all these things are inflationary. They've been stimulated by federal government as well as the state. So Cady Gallagher does have something to answer, and uh, she should pull it, her spending head in. Christy, let's talk about uh, the immigration debate. There was an interesting article in the Australian Enquirer section this week about how much traction Peter Dutton's getting out of the visa and immigration debacles for Labor. Dennis Shanahan, who I've got great regard for, he's written that Dutton has been demonstrating a superior strategic sense, a fearless confidence in his political judgment and a sense of leadership security in a team that may lack talent, they'll love that, but has grown to trust Dutton's instincts. Shanahan, right, is Dutton... Uh, and I did make the point 
both of you, I'll get your comments on this. I did make the point at the start that I think they've got to remember, as Paul Murray keeps reminding them, that the number one issue still has to be cost of living. I think you'd both agree with that. But uh, what do you think, Christy? Is Dutton making traction on the immigration argument? He is making traction. It's really interesting that uh, Labor's had Ed Cusick out, the member for Chifley, which includes Western Sydney um, suburbs such as Bankstown uh, and Mount Druitt, which have a, have a significant population of people who are very likely uh, to fall into um, the viewpoint of supporting uh, the Free Palestine movement. And certainly those electorates are targeted for... Uh, the Muslim Voice Party, should it uh, get its administration together in time and pose a threat to the Labor Party. That's another argument. But they've had Ed Husick out saying, we gave people visitor visas because they were easier to process, as you mentioned in your editorial. Labor sees that comment as an electoral asset. They see that as something that's pitching to their base and pitching to their voters. They think that was a good comment to make, whereas the coalition sees Dutton's line as an electoral asset as well. You've got a situation where both parties are fighting for barely 30% of the middle voting, uh, and they are both thinking that they are onto a winner in terms of their political strategy. I think Dutton is edging ahead of Labor. He seems to be continually one step ahead of the Prime Minister. He has demonstrated a number of convictions now, first the voice, then certainly falling uh, into pro-Israel and supporting the Jewish community. Now he's taking a hard line stance on the Gaza issue and the immigration issue, all of this adds up to someone who's strong, has values, has conviction, and we're seeing that in poll after poll after poll, he's edging out the Prime Minister in those categories. So, yes, it is working, it is an asset, and the coalition certainly is falling in behind him. James, I think you'll agree with this. I mean, you know, the Gazan Palestinians, let's put them to one side, the more broader question of immigration. The people that I speak to on a regular basis uh, where we've got this housing crisis and where, you know, the roads are clogged with, with cars and traffic and, I mean, it's almost impossible to get around parts of, of Melbourne and Sydney. Mm. Uh, I think the broader immigration question is fertile ground for Peter Dutton as well. I hope he's not too timid in talking about, OK, we've brought 1.5 million people into Australia during the two years of the Albanese government. Can we not just put a pause button on that for a while and, and reset and get ourselves back in some sort of normal, fa normal immigration numbers? Well, One Nation have certainly uh, been calling for a moratorium on immigration for some time now. Pauline Hanson and Malcolm Roberts have both been very strong on that fact. Unfortunately, uh, for both parties, they've been uh, too tempted to use the racist card in the past. But Peter Dutton, to his credit, has caught up and understands now the pressures that this country and everyone who live within it, whether you've come to this country of recent times or you're born here, we are all feeling the impacts, whether it be the long waiting lists to get into see a, a doctor or get into the hospitals for elective surgery, uh, even just the traffic on the roads. But Dutton here has supported previous uh, humanitarian programs, keeping in mind that uh, we've taken in 11,000 Ukrainians. Dutton certainly didn't put up any defence to that. Uh, we've certainly taken in some Afghans as well, uh, following uh, you know, the, the takeover by the Taliban. And uh, for good reason too. Those people certainly assisted Australia when we were over there. But he's got a very sensible point here. You cannot vet these people that we intend to take in some 3,000 people uh, within one hour. And keeping in mind, the Americans haven't taken in many at all. Last year, after the conflict started, they took in just 56. And we're taking them in on these, effectively, tourism visas, unchecked, and there is no sense, uh, according to the Albanese government, of sending these people home. And as you rightly pointed out earlier, to what home? It's all been destroyed. But we are not the country. We are not to be the dumping ground of the world every time a conflict takes place. Australia just can't cope. We're not coping now, and we're not going to cope if we take these 3,000 
or however many it ends up being under this Labor government. And Christy, I think, you know, if you're struggling to find a place to rent or struggling to find a house you can afford yep. to buy, and you look at the fact that places like Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia are taking none of these Palestinian people, it, they live in that region. I just don't quite understand, unless there's a direct and very strong family tie, that people, that, that, that we would be taking those people. I mean, James is quite right. We don't want to be, I mean, it's harsh to say a dumping ground, but you have to query why the countries around that region are not taking the, those people themselves. Well, and at the same time, you have to query, as, as James made the point, and the coalition has a very good track record on humanitarian assistance uh, for populations fleeing war zones, Kosovo, Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine, certainly, uh, Syria. Uh, all of those people were vetted, checked, processed in a third country. And as you were saying, a lot of critics of Dutton's are saying, but uh, Hamas controls Gaza. Uh, they're not letting people leave Gaza. Uh, so it's very difficult for those people to be processed in a third country. Uh, that is a point made after the fact uh, of the government issuing tourism vis visitor visas. Uh, they're very quick to do it. It's been going on since October last year. Uh, and now questions are being asked, well, what's the vetting and security process? Does it align with our previous intake where we took people from war zones? No, it doesn't. It's not comparable. The government has questions to answer. Uh, and that debate needs to be had. Paul always asked you for a bold prediction. I won't give you mine because I might undercut either of you, but James, what do you think the, the big story is going to end up being this week? Uh, we're going to go back to this whole immigration issue. It, it, it is going to be the Achilles heel for this Labor government. Uh, it's why they're losing votes. It is why they're going to continue losing votes. And, and as we see a probable security risk to Australia, that's the security measure we've been put on, the, the footings of, of Australia now sits at a probable terrorism attack. Uh, it, it is just going to add more fuel to the fire, and I think a lot of Australians are, are going to fear uh, the unchecked numbers of these people coming into the country under the Labor government. Christy, what do you reckon? Uh, I agree with James. Immigration is a strong point. National security is a strong point um, for the coalition. I also agree with you too, Steve, less about the specifics of Gaza. As you say, Australians are concerned about inflation, they're concerned about their cost of living. That is the number one yeah. issue. But this issue will play bigger to immigration and national security, which will continue to see Dutton, I think, accelerate above the government. Yeah, they're concerned about cost of living unless they're a Victorian public servant about to get a $5,600 cheque yeah. to off <laughs> offset the cost of living, which would be, go a long way to filling I the car up like with petrol. I feel like an idiot for employing people and running a business. I could just stay home three days a week and, and get my cheque from Jacinta Allen. Yeah, stick your Ugg boots on and work in front of your laptop. Uh, James Ashby and Christy McSweeney, thank you very much for joining us.